This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Think of that feeling when you finish a walk, run, or a workout. You're refreshed, calm, and even a little proud. Therapy can feel the same, but for your mind. Build your mental strength at betterhelp.com super. Hey, brother! We all know Harry was dealt a pretty rough hand in life when he became destined to be raised by the Dursleys. First, you've got Petunia, who has long resented her sister's magical abilities, and then Uncle Vernon, who's basically the most unmagical person on the entire planet. This, of course, means that Harry has to suffer years and years of abuse as he, of course, grows more and more into his own magical abilities. But what if things had been different. What if Lily wasn't the only magical daughter to come out of the Evans family? What if Petunia had also been a witch? Being slightly older, she would of course headed off to Hogwarts first, where she would no doubt have been sorted into Slytherin. Slytherin! And the question is, would this change everything? Or would Petunia still end up despising her little sister for not only being one of the most popular girls at school, but also one of the most talented magically? I was the only one to see her for what she was. A freak. How would she feel about her own head of house, Horace Slughorn, inducting her little sister into the infamous Slug Club while she got left behind? And above all else, what would it mean for a young Severus Snape, a future Slytherin himself, who suddenly may have a lot less reason to resent Petunia? Today, we find out what would have happened if Petunia was a witch. Okay, so to answer this question, I think we need to start at the very beginning, which is to say, almost the very end. The Prince's Tale. Many of us spent nearly a decade and thousands of pages basically despising Snape before finally getting to hear his side of the story. And as Harry explores Snape's memories at the end of Deathly Hallows, we get a rare glimpse into the childhood of Snape, Lily, and Petunia, where it is evident almost immediately that Petunia is extremely jealous of her sister. Stop it, shrieked Petunia. It's not right. But her eyes had followed the flower's flight to the ground and lingered upon it. How do you do it? It, she added, and there was a definite longing in her voice. That might happen in chapter 33 of the seventh book, but this is basically chapter one through the green eyes of jealousy that is the life of Petunia. Basically, if you have something I want and can't have, I will choose to dislike that thing. And we obviously know that as she grows older, this manifests in a thorough hatred of anything magic. Freak! But before that, she actually goes as far as to writing to Dumbledore to see if she can go to Hogwarts too, which of course she can't. It all suggests that Petunia craves desperately to be as special as her sister, but what if she was? How does it change that childhood scene? Well, based on what we know about Petunia, she basically has three distinct personality traits. First, she loves feeling superior to others. Two, she's extremely jealous. And three, she loves her family. Although true in some cases, like with Lily, it is like deep, 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 deep down there, but, but she does. You didn't just lose a mother that night in Godric's horror, you know. I lost a sister. In fact, a lot of that suppressed love, I dare say, manifests itself in the 17 layer chocolate fudge cake that is her love of her little diddykins. Successfully and thoroughly proving that there can be too much of a good thing. In any case, going back to her childhood, the fact that she's the older sister means she is going to be the first one to discover that she has magical powers. And upon this discovery, she is going to be elated. And it's possible and even likely that a young Severus Snape, even though he's a little bit younger, would still identify identify Petunia as another magical child in his vicinity and try and befriend her the same way he usually does with Lily. Again, she's a little bit older, but at the same time, Snape possesses a wealth of knowledge about the magical world that he could tell her about. But the point is, finding out she's magical is like having physical proof that she is special and superior to others. I can even see her finding it deep within her heart to have pity for her little regular sister, and her first two years at Hogwarts are no doubt absolutely marvelous. It honestly wouldn't be terribly dissimilar to the relationship between Draco and Harry, where Draco shows up at Hogwarts and just totally expects to be the Billywig's bum. Bees knees? 
Something like that, you get it. We said it earlier, but Petunia definitely gets sorted into Slytherin House, which would honestly be pretty unique for her as well, since not many Muggleborns ever get sorted into Slytherin, which I'm sure in Petunia's mind means she is just that much more exceptional. Everything would be going great in her life, until Lily discovers that she too has magical powers. Oh dear. Get it, dear, doe. <laughs> Classic Patronus joke. And this would of course cause extreme jealousy for Petunia, like her big unique thing that made her obviously superior and special now has to be shared. She is no longer special. Although for clarity, this actually doesn't make her any less special at all. This belief is just an unfortunate side effect of jealousy. That if can be ignored, allows the user to maintain their sense of purpose and uniqueness. Which on that note, friendly reminder to you, the viewer at home, you are super and we are happy to have you here. Anyway, Lily has powers, Petunia is upset, and it only gets worse because her former playmate, Snape, now has someone his exact age in his year that he can uh, hang out with. And while I doubt that Petunia thought that much of Snape at first, I am equally certain that she will absolutely hate having him taken away from her by Lily. But so what does Petunia do about this? How does she handle Lily being a witch? Well, the same way she always handles this kind of problem, by creating as much disparity between her and her sister as humanly possible. It's the exact move she pulls with Harry on his entire life with Dudley. Like, it's not enough to just make Harry's life worse. She also has to go above and beyond in spoiling Dudley. It almost makes you wonder if Dudley would have been raised with a more appropriate level of care and attention had this need to drive the gap between him and Harry not existed. But going back to Petunia at school, this would mean doubling down on all things Slytherin, especially after Lily got sorted into their rival house, Gryffindor. Gryffindor! Which on that note, Snape being sorted into Slytherin would also be a big win for Camp Petunia. But now we get to a very interesting question, which is, would Snape still have a crush on Lily in this scenario? Obviously he knew Petunia first and they're both in Slytherin together, but at the same time, Lily is his exact age, and Lily does possess that certain je ne sais quoi about her that I think means yes, they probably does still have a crush on her, at least for a while. At the very least, we know that the rest of the school will certainly take notice of Lily, who we know to be one of the best students of the year. For example, we mentioned this earlier, but we know she was part of the Slug Club, which is going to be a tremendous blow for Petunia. I mean, having the head of her house, Slughorn, overlook her in favor of her younger Gryffindor sister? Are you kidding me? I mean, it is like Lily is out to literally steal all of Petunia's specialness. But speaking of hyper-talented students, to the school that year, we know the Marauders will also be around for Petunia's time at Hogwarts, and as ever, they will be picking on Snape. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. I can't imagine Petunia's presence at the school changes anything. And Snape's friendship with Lily never really seemed to have anything to do with it. It feels like the Marauders only ever dislike Snape on good old-fashioned principle, which incidentally is one of the worst reasons to dislike somebody. But while we're on the subject of high school politics and disliking people on principle, let's talk about Petunia's friends because I have a feeling she starts to fall into the same crowd as the Narcissa Blacks of the day, who incidentally would be at Hogwarts at the exact same time as Petunia, which is to say students that identify highly with the burgeoning Death Eater crowd who are all about blood superiority. And you might think, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, Petunia, lest we forget, is a, um, Muggleborn? And while yes, that is very true, it is not like Petunia hasn't turned a blind eye to hypocrisy in her day now, is it? Think for example of Dudley and his inappropriate eating habits or his generally foul demeanor. As far as Petunia is concerned, he's very healthy and very well behaved. Plus, don't forget that within the ranks of the Death Eaters, blood purity hypocrisy is high. I mean, Voldemort himself is the half-blood. <laughs> but all this, I think, really points to one inevitable conclusion, that Petunia and Snape end up married. I mean, 
it's just math. They've known each other forever. They're both in Slytherin. Petunia hates Lily, who marries James, who hates Snape, so Snape must be good because James dislikes him. And Snape is the mate who makes her the most different from her sister. I mean, heck, he might even be the only person in their year who's actually better at Lily in potions. And honestly, both Snape and Petunia could be entering into this marriage for their own selfish reasons of making Lily jealous. A marriage truly destined for success. Am I right? Regardless though, their union does mean that against all odds, Snape manages to procreate and has a child a smidge older than Harry, but who will still attend Hogwarts the same year as Harry. What's his name? Well, I'm sure you can guess it based on the naming convention of his parents, right? Which is to say alliterative flower-based names like Lily, Petunia, Dudley, Dursley, Severus Snape. And as such, obviously they named their son, I don't even have to say it, say it with me, Sunflower Snape. No, sadly, as excellent as that would be, and actually kind of appropriate as sunflowers represent haughtiness, there is actually a way better and more obvious option. Scabious Snape. Scabious is actually a kind of flower. It starts with the letter S and means, wait for it, unfortunate love. Yeah. It is literally perfect in like every way. And I'd like to think Scabious, or Scab for short, brings out the best in these two. And maybe he does for like, I don't know, a day. I mean, we know they're both capable of deep love and certainly not above a little favoritism, but that happiness is not to last because of what happens next. Snape, overhears the prophecy. This of course leads to the same conclusion as usual. Voldemort targets down Harry and the Potters and somehow leads to even worse consequences for Snape. Normally this results in the killing of the woman he loves. And I guess on some level that could still be true, but now it also kills his nephew and his brother-in-law who are of course the entire rest of his wife's family. And well, sorry, I say it kills his nephew, but obviously we know that Harry survives. The actual other victim of Voldemort's attack though is Snape's marriage. We said it earlier, but Petunia's main three traits are the sweet and savory flavor of feeling superior to others, jealousy, and the love of her family. And now suddenly her husband is responsible for the death of her sister. And on some level, she may even blame herself for help supporting Snape's views and all things like Slytherin and Voldemort and Death Eater and all that. And I think we can pretty accurately guess what happens next based on how we know the characters in the main story. Obviously, Snape turns his back on Voldemort. Petunia does as well, but she takes it one step further and turns her back on all things magical at all. This means she denounces her own magical powers and abandons Snape and her son, Scabius. She copes by setting off to assume the most muggle-oriented life she can possibly muster. The only remnant of her magical past is, of course, baby Harry, who she still ends up with. Harry himself is, of course, quite magical, but she has plans for that. She's gotta squash it out of him. It sounds bad, but not only does it fall in line exactly with Petunia's motives in this situation, but she would still know that Voldemort could possibly return and try and hunt down Harry as well. So she might even see this as being the safest thing for Harry. Just no magic at all. It only leads to trouble. In any case, as part of her determination to be as non-magical as possible, she seeks a job at the most muggle place she can find. A place called Grunning. They sell drills. I know, I know, but let me tell you something about the what ifs. They have two rules. One, prophecies, still got a prophecy. And two, Petunia and Vernon always find each other. True love always prevails. That's like the theme of the entire story, right? Even if this version of true love gives me a weird metallic taste in my mouth. Now, obviously this happens a little bit later than usual since Dudley is usually older than Harry. However, with all that extra bachelor time, Vernon took up boxing, the noble sport, and goes under the moniker, Vernon the Burn Dursley. But it also means Harry is now dealing with two pretty difficult cousins. One, Scabious Snape, and two, Dudley the Dud Dursley. I mean, we can't make this stuff up, you guys. Well, I mean, I guess we can, because we did. But it fits like a glove. A boxing glove. And guys, now we need to take a quick pause to thank today's sponsor, MeUndies. Let me ask, you know that feeling you get when your crush texts you just like out of the blue? Or when your partner leaves you like a sweet little note in your lunchbox that you're not expecting and you unfold it and it says, 
I love you. Well, that's how it feels wearing the new limited edition MeUndies Valentine's Day collection. And you can add some heat to your V-Day with 20% off your first purchase when you head over to MeUndies.com slash theories. Seriously, guys, I only wear MeUndies these days. It's the only underwear for me. And like, I would, I would prove it to you, but you know. YouTube. But once you discover how comfortable underwear can be with MeUndies, you will definitely decide, like me, that there's really, there's no reason to ever feel uncomfortable again. It's kind of like this video, like don't repress your magic, wear your magic. It is a treat, a literal treat to put them on in the morning. And I know this sounds weird to say, but I actually feel more confident when I'm wearing them because my body just feels better. And guys, love should be fun. So whether you love someone else or just love yourself, it's usually a good time. That's why MeUndies has super comfortable and cute undies, bralettes, loungewear, and more in flirted new for this V-Day season. Comfort is cute, so get matching with someone you love or just match with your favorite ball of fur for the cutest pics anyone's ever seen. Available in sizes XS to 4X, they have something for everybody to fall in love with. So one more time to get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and to chat with MeUndies' incredible Cheek Squad about any sizing issues you might have, head over to MeUndies.com slash theories. One more time, that's MeUndies.com slash theories. Link in the description down below. Now, it must be said that Petunia does treat Harry significantly nicer this time around. Maybe not like nice in general, bringing it up from like a zero to like a two maybe, but that's like, that's like a 20% increase. That's what I'm gonna call an uncle all that success. The big difference is that this time around, Petunia is harboring a big secret that she doesn't share with the burn, which is that she is of course a witch and that Harry is a wizard. In fact, she could also probably be pretty worried that Dudley himself is a wizard, but you guys don't need to worry about that. Nobody with the Vern's DNA is magical at all. But it does mean that Petunia is constantly doing her best to repress her own magic while also trying to conceal the fact that Harry has magic. Which is basically how the story goes anyway, until Harry turns 11 and his owl shows up to give him the news about Hogwarts. In the meantime though, that is 11 years of Petunia repressing her own magic. I wonder if that'll have any negative consequences. Now, you might wonder, when Hagrid shows up to collect Harry, would Petunia reveal the fact that she is a witch even then? And honestly, I don't think so. Again, she has built a life around swearing off this part of her life entirely. Which means Harry's first couple of years go down about as you'd expect with one obvious new twist, which is that Severus Snape now has a son in Harry's year. And oh boy, if you thought Snape hated Harry the first go round, well, this time Snape's ex-wife abandoned him and their very magical son to swear off magic, but for some reason still raise this very clearly magical young boy, the git with the glasses, who looks exactly like Snape's old bully. Honestly, I don't think I'd like Harry either. Now, for Scab's part, he is unaware that the famous Harry Potter is actually his cousin, as is basically everyone in the wizarding world. In fact, the identity of his mother has been a long whispered mystery. See, it turns out Snape and Petunia's marriage was not widely known at the time. They decided to keep it pretty under wraps since Petunia was muggle-born and you know, Voldemort. Snape had assumed that the glory he would receive from Voldemort for delivering him the news about the prophecy would be enough to finally reveal this secret to the public. But it turns out that delivering that news to Voldemort is also the thing that ended his marriage. So much like Petunia, who renounced everything to do with magic after the death of Lily, Snape himself continued to follow their secret of life and sever any connection he ever had to Petunia. Now on the whole, I like to think that Scab doesn't actually dislike Harry like many of the other Slytherins do. But he is in Slytherin, and so for the first few years of his schooling, he does march to the beat of that Draco Malfoy drum. But otherwise, he's a lot like his father was in school. He's just really quiet and a hyper diligent student. But also like Snape, he's kind of unpopular. Obviously, his father shows him a lot of favoritism, but rather than bolstering his status like it might for Malfoy, like, you know, having the approval of a well-respected professor, for Scab, it just drags him down further and comes across as unearned parental favoritism, even though he's actually a really good student. In the meantime, Harry's first couple of years go exactly as you'd expect. Harry quickly makes the House Quidditch team and wins the House Cup two years in a row and fends off Voldemort two years in a row. Honestly, when you compare him to Scab, he does seem like kind of a tryhard. Can't you just go to class, man? But that brings us to the summer before Harry's third year at school, where as usual, Harry is summering with the Dursleys. 
activities. Petunia in this time has grown increasingly harsh as her tireless efforts to suppress her own magic are starting to take a noticeable toll on her physical body. Petunia is just about at her breaking point, which is bad news because this is, of course, the time when Aunt Marge and her dog Ripper arrive and they are as insufferable as ever. Marge, as you may recall, can barely take two steps into the house before she starts taking jabs at Harry's parentage. You know, comparing his rearing to that of bulldogs, and Harry, for one, is tired of taking this abuse. Typically, this is where Harry's magic gets a little bit out of control and he inflates her to the size of a weather balloon and she begins to float away. The difference this time around is that Harry is not the only person in the room who is taking such nasty offense to all of Marge's harsh words. Petunia, at this point, who has three big traits, superiority, jealousy, and a deep, deep love of her family, and is now struggling with repressing her magic for over a decade. Which, if you don't know, repressing your magic for that length of time can result in one pretty bad outcome and Obscurus. Which, if you don't know, is what happened to Dumbledore's sister Ariana and is what happening to Credence in the Fantastic Beast movies. But with all of her rage directed at Marge, the Obscurus finally bursts out of her. It destroys half the house of number four Privet Drive and leaves Marge dead. Which, like, I know, pretty intense, but it doesn't stop there. You may recall that what typically happens on this evening after Harry inflates Marge is that he abandons the Dursleys and accidentally calls the night bus after tripping because he's scared by Sirius Black. Meaning that on the night in question, Sirius is obviously very nearby, and when he sees the giant explosion coming from the house where he thinks Harry is supposed to be, he obviously rushes into action. He immediately appears on site to discover the house in ruins, Marge dead, and Petunia stuck in the middle of a parasitic magical rage. But here's the thing, even though Sirius is there to help, the surprise arrival of Sirius Black is about the worst thing that could have happened in this moment. Not only is he just a surprise blast from the past, but he's also her ex-husband's bully, and as far as Petunia knows, the other person most responsible for her sister's death. As she sees Sirius, her anger explodes again. Sirius pulls out his wand and does his best to control the Obscurus, but it's no use. At the last second, he's able to grab Harry and escape, but Petunia's days are done. The magic explodes out of her one more time, and she's left dead. Dudley and Vernon actually manage to survive this encounter somehow and are found shortly after as the sole witnesses of the night's events. And believe it or not, they actually know exactly who Sirius Black was, having seen him on the Muggle News earlier that week. And they tell everyone what happened. Sirius Black showed up, shot a bunch of spells at Petunia, and then kidnapped Harry. And this is very bad for Sirius, as breaking out to kidnap Harry is exactly what people were afraid he broke out to do. And if you recall, he was originally imprisoned for killing a wizard, blowing up a street, and leaving a bunch of dead muggles in his wake. Now, after breaking out of prison, he was seen at the scene of a muggle death where the house was exploded and there's a dead witch. Not to mention he also kidnapped Harry Potter. Now, Sirius isn't dumb. He is extremely aware of how bad this looks and doesn't have time to explain everything to Harry. He says enough to tell Harry that he's his godfather and that he can explain everything he just needs somewhere safe to do it. Is there anywhere we can go? Harry, unsure if he can trust him, but intrigued by this claim that Sirius Black is his godfather and curious about his surprise savior, suggests the burrow. Upon arrival at the Weasleys in the middle of the night, Harry arrives and Mrs. Weasley doesn't even think twice about fixing Harry a nice giant bowl of hot onion soup, 12 sausages, and a bit of toast. Harry begins to explain everything that's happened that night, but of course, in all the commotion, they've woken up Ron, who arrives downstairs in the kitchen, pleasantly surprised to see his best friend and holding his pet rat scabbers. <laughs> Uh oh. Sirius and Peter immediately take notice of each other and recognize each other at once. While Sirius knows it's better if Peter is brought in alive so that he can have some evidence that can clear his name, it doesn't really matter. He knows that once Peter recognizes him, he's gonna run. The time to act is now. Sirius lunges at Ron, who goes down and lets go of Scabbers, who after a brief chase throughout the house, Scabbers escapes. This leaves Sirius in a really bad spot. The only person who could clear his name has now escaped into the night. And in the short time Sirius has been out, it appears he's committed a crime exactly like the one that got him imprisoned in the first place. All he's really accomplished in this night is getting through to Harry that he must be innocent in some way because otherwise, why wouldn't he have just killed Harry? He easily could have. So sadly, Harry can't go live with Sirius who must remain on the run, which leaves Harry with a new problem. 
where is he going to live? Harry is hoping maybe he can just live with the Weasleys from now on, and Molly agrees of course she would take him in. But of course, that's not what happens. Dumbledore explains everything to Harry, that when his parents died, Dumbledore put a charm on him that keeps Harry safe as long as he can call home where his mother's blood lives. But my mother and her sister are dead, and there's no way Uncle Vernon's gonna let me live with him. In fact, you do. Not many people knew of the marriage, but before your aunt married Vernon Dursley, she had a wizard for a husband, and together they had a child. You know him. He attends Hogwarts with you. I can't have a cousin at Hogwarts. I'm Harry. Yes, and your mother's blood runs in him the same as it did in your aunt. As long as you stay with him, Voldemort cannot touch you. But who is it? Dumbledore tries for a smile, but just sighs. Your cousin is Scabius. And that's how, if Petunia was a witch, Snape comes to raise Harry at his home with his cousin. I'm just saying, if you guys wanna like see what happens, want like a part two or something, like maybe hit that subscribe button. As ever, thank you so much for watching today's video. If you want some more what if Harry Potter action from us, we have a different version of the way that night goes down when Aunt Marge comes to visit. What if Harry never called the night bus and Sirius had been able to explain everything to him that night? You can find out the answer to that by clicking this video right here. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.